If you have your Bibles, join me in Exodus 20, verse 12. That's where we'll be at. <clears throat> My name is Ricky Spindler. I'm the lead pastor here. It's a privilege to have you with us. And some of you, man, I haven't seen you this early at church for a long time. Man, that, that daylight savings time, man, got you up a little bit earlier than you thought, huh? That's good. I like it. I would just say that we're continuing our series on the Ten Commandments and the work that God is doing in your life is really centered around the morality of the Ten Commandments. The scripture says that in the past God wrote them on tablets of stone, but in our lives he's by the finger of God, which is the Holy Spirit, he's writing them on the tablets of our heart. Discipleship looks like God bringing your life in all of its expressions into the boundaries, the moral boundaries of the Ten Commandments. They are really pathways of freedom. And the ultimate end of the Ten Commandments is uh, the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So these, these Ten Commandments we've been spending the last few weeks looking at, and again, today we'll look at the fifth one. And I want to begin in an obscure place and end up in a familiar place. So you stay at Exodus 20, verse 12, and, and then I'll, I'll land there in a few moments. One of the things that I, had, I love to do is I love to hike uh, trails, especially in mountainous regions. Uh, last year, I had an opportunity to have a, a stayover on my way down on a vacation uh, in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And what I love to do there is get up early and walk the trails in the Smoky Mountains. And this particular day, I got up early and was going to Rainbow Falls. And as I got higher up the side of the mountain, I, I saw people coming down. And over and over again, they said the same thing. Hey, there's a bear in the tree along the side of the trail, up around the corner, about a half a mile up. Well, how in the world do you measure a half a mile on a trail? And so, again, people would like, finally, they're like, it's around the corner. So I'm standing around the corner on this trail, peeking around, and I see this big old black mama bear and two cubs. She's climbing down the tree, and I see her lay down in the grass right next to the trail, waiting for a snack to come by, which was not going to be me. So I turned around and, 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 and ran back down the trail and figured out something else. But it got me thinking about this documentary that I watched. On, it's called the, the Grizzly Man, if you've ever seen this documentary. It's about a Timothy Treadwell who lived with grizzly bears in Alaska. He lived with them for 13 years and said he was a, a, a member. He was a wild animal and they accepted him. Ultimately, he was eaten by grizzly bears in the end of the documentary. It's a crazy story. But in this doc, we got a grizzly bear on the screen for you. Now, let me just tell you this. Have you ever said, if they see one of these in the wild, just play dead? You know, you ever hear that? Like, who's going to do that? Like, if I see one of those, I'm running, and hopefully I'm outrunning you, okay? That's not really. But in that documentary, he, he said something. He'd spent his lifetime studying bears and living amongst them, and he said the, he had a rule called the 25th bear. And his principle was this, one out of every 25 bears is a deranged bear. He said, 24 bears, we're all good, they're going to leave you alone. But that 25th bear got a little something different in his eyes. And he said that that 25th bear uh, not only is a danger to its prey, it's a danger to other bears because it sees its peers as a food source and will eat other grizzly bears. And then he said, it's also a danger to humanity because that 25th bear sees humans as a food source as well. And he said, the problem is, you never know when you're going to meet the 25th bear. So just stay away from all of them is what I'm saying, the 25th bear. You know, when I heard that story in that documentary, I immediately thought of a verse. In 2 Kings chapter 2, there is a, a story of the prophet Elisha. He's visiting a town called Bethel, which historically, in the history of Israel, it, it means this, the house of God. It is where um, Jacob uh, and the wilderness falls asleep and is visited by an angel, and, and he gets up the next day and says, God was here and I didn't even know it. 
I'll name this Bethel, the house of God, a rich history. If there's anywhere a prophet should have been welcome, it should have been in the city of Bethel, the house of God. But things, there was so much spiritual decay there that we're told that when he shows up, rather than being celebrated and honored, uh, he is made fun of and mocked. It says, evidently he had bald head because the 40, uh, 42 of the youth around 20 to 40 years old of the city, mocked him and said, go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. Don't be careful making fun of bald-headed people, okay? And they were alluding to Elijah who was, went up to heaven in a chariot, and they were telling him to do likewise but making fun of them. Now watch this. Elisha curses them. He says, you're cursed. And it says, a short time later, here's this verse. It says, two bears came out of the woods. Some, uh, it says, and mauled 42 of those boys. That doesn't mean it killed them, but it tore them up. It taught them a lesson. Two bears. In one translation, it says two she-bears. Come on, don't mess with the mama bears up in here. I mean, there were two 25th bears in one place in that story, okay? But when I read that, I, I thought about this, is that honor or a lack of honor is very telling of our true spiritual condition. And it, 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 let me say it to you like this. In the great theological show, like Sesame Street, come on, where they have the word of the day, the word of our day today will be honor. Before I speak into a local context, I just want to speak in broad terms because a lack of honor tells us something, especially for the things of God. It's indicative of our spiritual condition. Actually, Jesus connects it to our faith in Matthew 13. He shows up to do a miracle, and, and he's, he's on a roll, man, city after city. In fact, he says, I'm going to go back to my hometown. And when he gets there, it's a very different story. In fact, very little happens. Here's what it says. It says, and they took offense at him. The place where he should have been celebrated, they're offended but Jesus said to them, a prophet's not without honor except in his own town, in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Think about it. They were so familiar with him. I mean, he's the one that he, he, he got the gas at the gas station. He hung out at everybody's homes. Jesus, this is where he grew up. They were so familiar, they could not get past their familiarity and see the Son of God. So their lack of honor showed up in a lack of faith. Our honor is attached to the expressions of our faith. Here's another one. Isaiah 29 verse 13 says this. It says, the Lord says, the people come near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. When I read that, it means to me that honor is ultimately an attitude of the heart. A place where honor should be cultivated and should be expressed. It should, first of all, be an attitude of the heart. So what does this word honor mean in a biblical context? Honor in, in, in the Old Testament Hebrew means to praise highly, to show respect, to praise highly. I honor it. I praise it highly. I, I show respect or to give weightiness to it. It has a greater weight to it. In my home, on my bookshelves, I have a baseball that's elevated, uh, prominently placed so that kids can't touch it, but it's on display. I have a lot of other sports balls in my home, uh, basketballs, soccer balls, footballs, but that ball is different, and I give it greater honor because it's signed by a Hall of Fame baseball player. So it has a greater weight. I praise it more highly. It has a place of honor. In the scriptures, Exodus 20, verse 12, we come to the fifth commandment. Up to this point, we have uh, been told that we must keep God first in our lives, have no image of him. Uh, we are to um, not take his name in vain. The first three tell us how to vertically relate to God and to love him well. Then it comes down at a local level, our own lives, and the fourth commandment is you shall honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. That's how to love yourself well, self-care. But now, from here on out, the Ten Commandments focus on horizontal relationships and how we are to love others well. 
And the place where God wants to show us how to love others. In fact, it's from this relationship that all other relationships flow is in the father, mother, child context. It is the foundational building block that God is showing us here on how we are to love others. So he starts at our first relationship with our parents. And he says this, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land your God is giving you. Now, jokingly, how many of you ever had that quoted to you when your parents said, you better listen to me, okay? Because I, I brought you into this world. I can take you out of this world. You want to live long? You better honor your father and your mother. The operative word there, the key word, the verb in that is honor. Honor your father and your mother. So what I want to do in the remainder of our time, 20 minutes or so, I want to talk to you about how honor changes at different stages of our life. How do I honor at every stage of my life? And then what I want to at the end, I want to talk to you about the complexities of honor because sometimes it can get real messy. And how do I honor in the midst of messiness? So let's talk about how do I honor with my words and actions at every stage of my development. First is this. As children, we primarily honor by obedience. Well, I said, can I get an amen on that one? Um, Colossians 3.20 says, children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. I think it's primarily obedience because parenting early on is about establishing boundaries, teaching proper boundaries that hopefully will help the children move towards independence, but will help them keep them safe. I don't know about you, but when I had uh, that child placed into my hands for the first time, the first time I became a father, I was scared to death. I'm thinking, man, this thing is so tiny. I'm going to kill this thing if I don't watch it. I was terrified. I felt like my whole life was trying to keep this thing alive. I mean, you can't eat food on the floor. You got, no, no, we got to throw that away, man. uh, You don't touch this. Don't do this. I mean, I once stiff-armed a two-year-old to keep keep him off my little girl. Sorry, I had to do that, man. You don't mess with my kid. Okay. (laughs) Protection and... Um, but you know, the second kid comes and things change. You're like, five second rule, put that in your mouth, you'll be all right, just wash it off, you're good. You don't call the doctor, ah, they'll survive, it'll be fine. Uh, if you were the first child, any first children in here, they, they experimented on you. You were the experiment, you were the guinea pig. But uh, honor at a young age as children really comes down to one word, obedience. I will give a caveat to that as long as it's not illegal and unbiblical. Those are the two things we have to be careful about. But it's more about boundary setting for protection so that your days on the earth will be long. However, as children age, the relationship parent and child changes and we move into teenage years and and young adult years. And that is marked by one word, respect. Respecting them. Now, as we age, the reality is, is that our children or we ourselves, we begin to see the strengths and we begin to see the weaknesses of our parents. The veneer is off, the polish is gone, and we begin to see our parents as they really are. And the hard thing is, is how do I still honor them when I see blatant weaknesses and abnormalities in their character? I'll say this, if you can't honor the person, then honor the God-ordained position that they hold. Look past the person and honor the position. How do I do that, Pastor Ricky? You respect primarily by listening and by the tone you speak with. When they speak to you, body language matters. I show I value you and your position and honor you by the body language that I use and choose to listen to you with. And the other one is by the words that I use and the tone that I speak to you about. Because ultimately, as you grow into teenage years and young adult, you're moving from dependence to independence. 
from dependence to independence. You're learning how to make decisions on your own and to move within the boundaries set for you. And you're learning, hopefully, to have freedom and be a contributor of society. There's a verse in Psalms uh, 127. It says this, children are a heritage from the Lord and offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. I will just say this. I think something has gotten into our culture from both sides, parent and young adult, is we are delaying the release of the arrow. And there's no way, like how crazy would it be to walk around for 30 years with an arrow pulled back and never released? There has to come a moment, parent, where we let that arrow go. We release them to their God-ordained future. And if you're the one that's getting older and, and you can't quite... You know, one of the best sermons I ever preached when we did the Man Cave Men's Ministry was how to break up with your mom. <laughs> I mean, that was the quietest sermon I've ever preached in my life. I would just say, I got, I got a song for some parents in here. It's time to let it go, let it go. But in order... Listen, in order for them to reach and fulfill their God-given destiny, the nature of the relationship has to change. There can be respect, but there also has to come independence. That's free. That one even in the notes. Okay, next one is how do we honor as adults? Now, I will say this. The Ten Commandments were written and given primarily at the beginning to adults. When they were set free from bondage in Egypt, there was a generation of people. They were given to adults. So honor is required at every stage of life. And we honor in, into adulthood by appreciating them. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 talks about looking for ways to encourage and to build one another up. It's where I acknowledge your weaknesses, but rather than focus on them, even if it's just a grain of sand, I will find something that you did well and encourage you around that. I will show you appreciation. I will give thanks to you because it costs something to be a parent. Come on. It costs you time to be a parent. It costs you energy. You ever wonder where all your energy went? It costs you money. Well... They say a parent is somebody that has photos where they used to have money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the truth. And just thinking about uh, ways and finding ways that we can begin to show gratitude and appreciation for a price that has been paid. So we can truly honor at every single level and stage of life but here's the thing I think we need to camp out on in, in the remainder of our time, and this is where it gets complex, is that this commandment has no disqualification to it. It means that honor has no disqualification clause. It didn't say honor your parents, your father and mother, if they did a good job. It didn't say honor them if they were always present. Honor them if they... If they treated you well, no, it says honor your father and your mother. So with that in mind, I just want to speak directly to, to the hard truths and realities of honor. I will, speak, I will speak in broad principles, and there's no way I can get into the nuances of all of our complexities of our relationships. So I will speak with a broad stroke, realizing that it's got to be applied differently in different circumstances, but it is biblical truth that I'm sharing. First thought I would just like to say when it comes to honor, there's no such thing as a perfect parent. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. Maybe you've never realized it, but today is true. Your parents were not and are not perfect. And can I even go one step further? Neither am I, and neither are you. You haven't been, and you won't be perfect in all of your decisions and all the things that you've done. But listen, here's the beautiful part of this, is that we have a God of the gaps that is able and capable through his grace to, 
to fill in the gaps of our parenting insufficiencies and our parents' insufficiencies. That he is a God of the gaps. One of my favorite verses that I've prayed over my life. I, I grew up in a setting where for, for, for various reasons, my, my parents have been in and out for various reasons, primarily raised by my grandparents. This verse has spoken well over my life, and I've prayed it many times, where John 15, Jesus looks at his disciples and tells them to love one another as he loved them. He says, love as you have been loved. I want you to know that Jesus has the ability to love you well. He can love you in ways that your parents could not love you. I'll even say this, even if your parents were never present in your life in completely absence, I have a word for you. Psalms 27 verse 10, it says, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. I think many of us from time to time or what can plague us for our lives is that we suffer from an orphan spirit. We f- never feel like we have a family or we don't fit in. But God says, listen, I will redeem that situation with absent mothers and absent fathers, and I will adopt you, and I will take you into my family. You know, in my life, it's amazing to me how God has always provided spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers for me. He's always supplied what I needed at every season by bringing spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers into my life. So there's no such thing as a perfect parent. And let me just say this. We'll pray this at the end. I'll just say this. I think what plagues many of us is guilt and shame that chases us because of we feel like we've been a bad parent and we feel like we've ruined our children. Now listen to me. I want every eye to look this way. Listen. The scripture says, even if my heart condemns me, God is greater than my heart. And I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end to release guilt and shame and replace it with goodness and mercy. Because, listen, if God's big enough to forgive your sins, he can undo your bad parenting. It's the truth. Second little thought, caveat around this honor is it takes courage to make peace with your parents. Ooh, it's quiet in here today. It takes courage to make peace with your parents. Probably the biblical figure who had the most family issues, parent and sibling, to deal with and forgive was Joseph. And Joseph is uh, tried murdered by his brothers, tried to be murdered by his brothers. Death is fake, sold into slavery. His father's dysfunction ruins his life. Uh, But then it says in Genesis 39, verse 2, that the Lord was with Joseph. And then it says at the end, when it's finally coming to a conclusion, 11 chapters later, when his father and his siblings now have to come to him, and he's risen in prominence, and God has restored everything. Listen to what he says. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. He says the Lord was with Joseph. He found favor in a prison. The Lord was with Joseph. He was promoted to the highest levels. He saw great success. The Lord was with Joseph. He found lots of things. But you know what happened somewhere in a prison, somewhere in obscurity? Do you know what he found? He found forgiveness. You intended it for evil, but God, you turned it around for good. There was a perspective shift in Joseph. I'll just say this at some point. When it comes to the, our, our parents, some of the greatest wounds we'll ever experience in life will come from those who should have loved us the most. And let me just say this, there will come a point in your spiritual life where you will have to forgive them because your growth and freedom will depend upon it. And forgiveness, let me say this, is never an emotion. It is not emotion. It is a decision. It is an act of the will. Forgiveness is a decision, and right choices will eventually bring right emotions. The emotion of forgiveness 
over time will catch up to the decision of forgiveness. And let me say about forgiveness, what do I mean by that? Giving up the right for revenge. Giving up the right that they owe you something. They owe you nothing anymore. Um, uh, It means this, that I will no longer leverage their weaknesses and use it as a weapon against them in our relationship. Yeah. It's meaning I'm learning to love them as they are, not as I want them to be. But here's what I don't mean. It's not permission giving to allow the dysfunction to continue to destroy me. Sometimes forgiveness comes with clear boundaries, and that's okay. Sometimes there needs to be limitations, and that's not a bad thing. Boundaries are not a bad thing. But I will say forgiveness is not for the other person. It's always for you. And stop living in an invisible prison and allowing the past to have more control than it should. And I'm speaking from my own experience. Because there was a day when the Holy Spirit spoke to me when I graduated from college and told me to take my mom on a date and tell her you forgive her. Not for her benefit, but for mine. And that's true. You're right. Third thing I think about this is as they grow older, help take care of them. Do you know almost with great singularity the Western culture is pretty much the only culture in the world where we place more honor on the young than the old. It's the only culture in the world, almost singularly, where we value youth over age. It's the truth. It's sinful. And one of the things that I've been doing intentionally as I'm getting older is I'm hanging out with 70 and 80 year old leaders I'm intentionally once or twice a month in mentoring programs with 70-year-old leaders to glean wisdom from them and to honor them. World-class leaders, led at very high levels, gaining wisdom from them. You know, the most influential decade of your life, proven over and over again, is your 60s. Come on, all the 60-year-olds just got happy, didn't they? You know what the second most influential decade of your life is your 70s. We think it's our 20s, 30s, and 40s. It's not. It's our 60s and our 70s and our 80s where we have and wield great influence. You know what I love about Jesus? And he sets this model up for us. Here he is, son of God, dying, the weight of the sins of the world. And in John 19, it's almost like he just takes a detour. It said when Jesus saw his mother there, Mary, And the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, that's John, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Historically, we know that Joseph, his earthly father, must have died. And Jesus is concerned about the welfare and the care of his mother at one of the most crucible moments of his life. And I think that shows us that as our parents age, to the best of our abilities, help to take care of them. And that showing honor, not dismissing them, not letting them die alone, but to the best of our ability, take care of them. And then the last one is this. Always remember this. When it comes to honor, we will reap what we have sown. So when you're in your car and you're complaining about your parents, and you're treating them with disrespect, or you're saying horrible things about them, or complaining about how you have to do things, just remember the next generation is behind you, and they're listening. Galatians says you will always harvest what you plant, and honor is not excluded from that. You are training them and discipling them how to honor you when you get older. Remember that, and you will reap what you have sown. Now, as the worship team comes, I have to say something about this, because this commandment is the most unique commandment out of all ten, because it's the only commandment that has a promise attached to it. It's interesting. 
God attaches their future to the obedience of this commandment. And there's the second half of that. He says, honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. That your destiny, your future is connected to your ability to honor and to honor well. And here's what I wrote. Honor and the blessings of God flow together. If we never learn to cultivate an atmosphere of honor in our heart and our life, the blessings of God, the flow of them will dry up in our life. The Bible says this, is that if we don't honor even our spouse, he refuses to hear our prayers. How's that? That God watches how I honor my wife, watches how you honor your, your husband, your spouse, and it has an impact on him answering your prayers. The scripture says that in, in Revelations that all on the angels sing, honor and glory belong to the Lord. Honor is the atmosphere of heaven. It is the, it is the beginning of worship. It's just another word for worship. In Romans chapter 12, it says that we are to outdo one another in showing honor to each other. It's the only time in Scripture, I think, where we're told to have a competition with one another, to outdo one another in honoring. Listen, where will the, the world ever learn the principles of honor? It has to be in the church. And if we don't honor each other well and honor the God-ordained positions that God has placed over us, listen, the world will never learn it. It's one of the things that makes us unique. So with that in mind... I'd love us to respond to this through, in, uh, through a time of prayer. So I'm going to invite you, if you're able to, to stand so we get ready to close this out. Just a great word, honor. I want you again to take a posture of humility, to lower, bow your heads and just close your eyes and just create a, a prayer altar where you're at. Put your hands in front of your palms up again. Proverbs 18 says this, that humility comes before honor. So the pathway to honor is to humble ourselves before the Lord. And then in Proverbs 3, it says that we must honor the Lord first in all things. And maybe you've never honored the Lordship of Jesus. You've never made him first in your life, but you'd like to do that today. Right now, I won't belabor this because we did it earlier in the service, but if you need to make things right with Jesus and Him to be Lord of your life, just pray an invitational prayer right now, inviting Jesus to be your Lord and honor His life and sacrifice for you. But now let me move to the other side of the room. Those who are already in Christ. This is such a powerful word for us. And it just, it has implications for your future so that it may go well with you in the future. God has a promised future for you, but it's predicated on honoring well now. Would you just invite the Holy Spirit in your heart? Just tell him, Holy Spirit, help me to have in my heart a spirit of honor. Create a heart attitude in me, Lord, of one of honor. Lord, I humble myself before you. I honor you and your ways, Lord. Just tell the Lord you want, a, you want an atmosphere of honor in your life. And if this message has challenged you in any way, and you feel a conviction of the Holy Spirit, that's the love of God. That's Him parenting you. Just repent right now. And ask the Lord to renew a right spirit within you. Let me, also as you're praying, let me just speak to parents in here. Listen, the hardest person to forgive sometimes is you, is ourselves. Ask that humble wait yourself right before the Lord. And just say, Lord, remove from me the guilt and shame of my parenting mistakes. Come on. Just ask him to remove that. To remove the condemnation of that. Let his grace wash that away. 
Yeah, you did your best. Yeah, you were dealing with your stuff. That's true. But His grace is greater than all of that. And why don't you just give your children to the Lord again? Just say, Lord, I give my son and my daughter, my children to you. One more time, Lord. Would you love them well, Lord? Now, this may be the most difficult moment, but I just know in this place, man, because the Holy Spirit speaks to me about it. You need to move towards forgiveness. You got to choose it today. It's painful, but it's the right move spiritually. And just with the Holy Spirit's help, say, Lord, I choose to forgive and name them. My mom, my father. I choose today to forgive them. Lord, by faith, I do that. Ask the Holy Spirit to set you free. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit tattooing your heart with the Ten Commandments right now. This is you moving towards honor and away from bitterness and unforgiveness. The Lord is with you, and He's going to turn this around for your good. But it starts with you choosing forgiveness. I let it go, Lord. I let it go. And maybe you're here, and you just need healing, man. Listen, Ephesians 3. He's able to do above all that you can ask, think, or imagine according to the power at work within you. The greatest works of the power of the Holy Spirit are inside of you. And some of the greatest wounds will ever be healed it came from our parents. Come on, just ask Him to heal your heart, to remove insecurities. Oft, guys, listen, this is often the thing that is at the root of all of our other sins. It's just this sense of abandonment, these wounds that need to be healed. Ask Him to heal your wounds. That's what Jesus died for. And the wounds that meant to heal you now, there's still a scar there, but they're not open and infected. They're not going to kill you, but they tell a story. And now they're the source of life to others. Ask Him to make you a wounded healer. God, use my wounds now, Lord, to heal others, Lord. Father, I thank you for this tremendous just scripture. We're going to honor, honor our fathers and our mothers. Lord, so that may go well with us wherever our future takes us in the land, in the promised destiny. Put a spirit of honor in this place, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, help us to be on the lookout for that 25th bear. Come on. Don't let him get us, Lord. Protect us through a spirit of honor. We give you praise for your saving and changing work. In Jesus' name.